Faith Community Church presents Truth For Today. Is the Bible truly relevant to our lives today? Well, we believe that not only is it relevant, but practical, and most of all, life-changing for those who are truly seeking to answer life's questions. My favorite verse in all the Bible is in Hesitations chapter 1, verse 1. And Hesitations chapter 1, verse 1 says... No matter what God calls you to do, it will always be easy and life will be full of sunshine and rainbows. Let's put that up. Hesitation chapter 1. No? You don't have that? Do you have anything you can give me? Anything? What about John 16? Yeah, let's try that. Let's see if that's better. I have told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this world you will have trouble. That's not what I was looking for. But take heart, I have overcome the world. This is a promise, too. It's probably not on your fridge at home, but it is a promise. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus says, of all kinds. I looked up the word trouble in Greek, and it meant trouble. (laughs) Bad things, trouble. But fear not, I have overcome the world. And so when the trouble comes, there's a temptation for fear to rise. We can go one of two directions. We can either go in the direction of faith, Move forward or fear and be stagnant or move backward. Those are our two options. And sometimes even the strongest believer can find themselves in a dark valley of fear, can find themselves paralyzed by fear, can find themselves thwarted from accomplishing what God has called them to be and do. And that's what we want to talk about today. And Isaiah is going to write to Israel, who has succumbed to fear, They're looking around them. They're not seeing the fulfillment of the promises. And there is a temptation to abandon hope and to enter into despair. We've all been there. And some of us might even say we're there right now. But what does he have to say? We're going to look at some principles. And these principles are not new. In fact, I've shared these principles. You've heard sermons on these principles. However, they're repeated so many times in God's Word. That's because it's easy for us to forget. It's easy for us to forget. And and because it's reiterated so many times, we have to remember, though it's nothing new, it's something we have to experience ourselves. So let's go through Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 and 2, as we begin today to talk about these ways to go from fear to faith. First of all, God says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness who seek the Lord. So we're talking about a specific group of people. The promise he's about to give is not for everybody. It's for those who seek him. It's for those who pursue righteousness. That's who he's talking about. And the fear that we're talking about is not fear in the broad sense of the word, fear. It's fear that prohibits us or inhibits us from accomplishing his purposes in our life. Okay. Principle number one, is look to God and not self. Look to God. We want to change that to God and not to self. Let's put up verse 1 again and find that principle present there. Look to the rock from which you were cut, to the quarry from which you were hewn. In other words, you you know, remember what Jesus says to Peter? He says, I'm the rock, but you're the little rock. Right? You're the little rock. You're cut from me. Uh, the clip we saw says to Simba, you've forgotten who you are. You're the son of a king. You belong to me. My blood is in you. You've got a destiny. And so God is reminding Israel, you're from me. Remember the rock from which you were. Remember the things I've done. The next verse, in verse 2, he says, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who gave you birth. In looking to them, God says, you're going to see me. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. In other words, that's what faith will do. You're not alone when God is on your side. Abraham was multiplied. God says he will multiply us, multiply our effectiveness. Now, I think of Nehemiah in chapter 6, verse 11. We went through a series for a long time on this. Nehemiah is on the wall, and he is getting badgered by his enemies. 
And they're teasing him. They're saying, your wall's so weak, if a fox jumps on, it's going to fall down. And you're going against the king, and we're going to tell the king that you're plotting against him, and he's going to stop your wall. They didn't understand that he already had the king's blessing and knew that was a lie. And they try one temptation after another, and finally, they try the threat of death. It's like, come down and talk, or we will kill you. There's a plot going on, Nehemiah. They're going to kill you if you don't stop and come and talk. And listen to Nehemiah's response to their request. He says, but should a man like me run away? It almost sounds a little bit cocky and arrogant on the surface. Should a man like me? But he doesn't mean it in that way. That's not the vein in which he's saying that. Should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. What he's saying is, I know the rock from which I'm hewn. I'm accomplishing God's purposes. Should a man like me succumb to fear? I'm not going to do it. I'm living for God. I'm looking to God and not myself. You know, in the Old Testament, right, my pastor back home used to always say, when David fought Goliath, all Israel looked at Goliath and said, look how big Goliath is compared to us. And David comes on the scene and says, look how small Goliath is compared to God. And that's what Nehemiah was doing. He's like, you might be more armed, you might be more in numbers, but I serve the living God. And here's the thing that's kind of sad. You and I both, I'm including myself, there have been times that the discouragement and the words and the negativity of other people have thwarted us from accomplishing God's purpose, and we quit. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but there'd be more than one hand will go up, I promise you that. The times that we've allowed ourselves to become discouraged and give up and quit because of what other people have done or said. Or we lied too much on ourselves and not to God, and we failed. It's the very opposite of the world strategy. The world strategy is what? Pick yourself up by your, you know, your bootstraps, self-made man, self-made woman, you can do it. Everything you have is within you. But the Bible says that we're to have a dependency upon the divine. And we cannot do it on our own. We cannot overcome that we need His help. It's a different mindset. We look first to God, not to self. That's principle number one. But He's going to tell us to look again in verse 6 at another principle, verses 6 through 8. Let's look at those together. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment. Its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. Hear me, you who know what is right, you people who have my instruction to heart. Do not fear the reproach of mere mortals or be terrified by their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment. The worm will devour them like wool. But my righteousness will last forever my salvation throughout all generations. He is telling us here to focus on the eternal and not the temporal. And so that's the juxtaposition. That which is everlasting and that which is here and is fading. And if you want to go from fear to faith, you focus on the eternal and not the temporal. When somebody is living out this life, you can see it. It stands out. You recognize it. In fact, sometimes when somebody is living this way, it is so foreign to us sometimes that we're shocked that they're doing it. I remember one time when one of our pastors named Sean Christensen, he was our discipleship pastor before Pastor Tim came on staff. In fact, he discipled Pastor Tim. But after many years, he left our staff to go as a mission field with four small children to Haiti. And we were like, hey, time out, Sean. Uh, Are you aware this is like the poorest country in the world? Are you aware there's a high crime rate? Are you aware that it's like the voodoo capital of the world? And you're going to leave all of this and your family and friends and your church and the comforts of America and you're taking these children into squalor? And it's almost like we meant well, right? We all meant well, but we're actually trying to discourage him what God had called him to do and almost like trying to make him fearful of what God had called him to do. And I'm going to repeat this, what he said, and if you sound familiar to you, you probably are one who said it to Sean. Because he said, everybody says this to me. And Sean would say back, 
The safest place in the world to be is the center of God's will. Ooh, man. That's right. And so Sean says, we're not living for this world. We're not living for the things of this world. We're living to please the king. And I'm not going to give in to fear. We're going to overcome fear. It's the unknown. It's an unknown culture, but it's where God has called us to be. And so now he's been there for how long? Ten years. Ten years. It manifests itself in many different ways. I think of a woman in our church who we lost uh, very recently named Teresa Pope. And she was only 40 years old with two, two children. And she had bone cancer. And she had shared with us what she's gone through and the treatment for cancer and what it had done to her body and how brittle her bones were and how she was being held together by pins and rods. And I'd watch on a Sunday morning, there'd be people going, well, it might snow today, better not go to church. And she would come walking in in so much pain. And she'd come walking in and sit in the back. And she would come and lead her, co-lead her cancer support group here at our church. And I would look at her and think, there's a woman who's living for the eternal and not the temporal. She's not living for herself. She's living for God. Nothing's going to stop her from accomplishing God's purposes. Nehemiah builds the wall. The wall was temporal, but obeying God, that was eternal. Living for God's kingdom, that was eternal. And so we ask ourselves the question, what are we living for? In the book of, let's put up uh, the passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, Paul writes and says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, and inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now we read that inspiring passage from the Apostle Paul. And we're going to find a time that even Paul didn't practice what he preached. Let's turn to the third point of Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51, verses 9, 10, and 11. We'll examine those together. I want to, by the way, before we get into this point, I want to spend some time in verse 9. How many of you read this chapter and came to verse 9 and went, what? <laughs> you see your hands? Yeah, okay, well, let's, let's talk about that a little bit here. Uh, it's a problematic verse, and so I want to address it, and then we'll get back to our, the sermon that's already in progress here, here they say. We now interrupt this sermon for another sermon. Uh, it says, awake, awake, arm of the Lord. Cut yourself, clothe yourself with strength. Awake as in days gone by, as in generations of old. Was it not you who cut Rahab to pieces, who pierced that monster through? Verse 10. Was it not you who dried up the sea and the waters of the great deep and made a road in the depths of the sea that the redeemed might cross over? Okay, so let's go back to verse 9. Isaiah has been, God has been speaking through Isaiah, right? In the first person to, or God has been speaking through Isaiah to Israel. I believe what's happening here is Isaiah in verses 9, 10, and 11 is actually the one speaking. God is writing and empowering Isaiah, but Isaiah is speaking. And there is first of all a petition to God, and then a remembrance of God, and then a declaration that he gives us in verse 11. So first is the petition. And when we understand it as Isaiah speaking to God, then it makes sense. We'll read it again with that as our understanding. Awake, awake, arm of the Lord. Clothe yourself with strength. Awake as in days gone by, as in generations of old. God is, Isaiah is saying to God, do the things you did in the days gone by. We're talking about deliverance. We need deliverance. Deliver us as you have in the past. And he cites a couple of examples of that. Example number one, was it not you who cut Rahab to pieces, who pierced that monster through? Well, the word Rahab means pride. Almost always is translated pride. I saw it, it can mean storm if the context indicates 
uh, this is weather, then it's translated storm, but more often than not, it's translated pride. So Rahab, if you think, know about Rahab in the Old Testament, in the book of Joshua, her name literally meant pride. So when she would introduce herself in Hebrew, you'd say, hello, I'm John, hi, I'm pride, I'm Rahab. That's what the name meant. So this should not be a capital R here. Because you're reading that and you're saying, when was Rahab cut to pieces? She actually survived, and so did her family. That, this is not Rahab with a capital R. This is not the woman named Rahab. This is pride with a small p. It says, was it not you who cut pride to pieces, who pierced that monster through? This word monster is sometimes translated dragon, sometimes monster, but most often serpent. Now I ask you the question, in days gone by, when did God defeat pride in a serpent? In the garden, right? In, the, all, in days gone by, way in the back, God defeats the enemy. Pride manifests itself in the story in Genesis. Satan manifests himself in his pride. And God says, you know, and Isaiah says, you destroy pride. You, you pierced that serpent through. You defeated the serpent. Next verse. Was it not you who dried up the sea and the waters of the deep? Isaiah, this cannot be God speaking to Israel because Israel didn't part the deep. Israel, God did that. So it has to be Isaiah speaking to God, not God speaking to Israel. Isaiah is remembering God's acts of deliverance. Was it not you who dried up the sea and the waters of the deep who made the road in the depths of the sea, so that the redeemed might cross over. Yes, God, that was you. He's remembering God's past deliverances to give him faith for God's future deliverances. And then a declaration or a promise. Verse 11, those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee. That's the prophecy or the promise given through Isaiah. Very similar to verse 3 of this chapter. If we want to jump back to verse 3 of Isaiah chapter 51. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. Though it does not look that way now, though it looks desolate now, you will sing again. Joy will return And these are the periods of our life when it's dark. These are the times in our life when it seems like God's not listening. Our prayers aren't being answered. You know, I don't feel like I'm living for a purpose. I don't feel like I'm, I feel like I'm living in fear and not faith. And God says through His promises that hope, keep your hope. Hold on to the promise. And that's the third truth here. That we look to the promise and not the circumstances. I don't care how long you've been a believer, there have been times in your life when you have forgotten this truth and you've looked at the circumstances and situation and you forgot the promises of God. Even Paul, I mentioned to you, even Paul did this. I'll show you an example of this principle. In the book of Acts, the 23rd chapter and the 11th verse, Paul has been testifying before the Sanhedrin and Jesus himself appears to him. And says this, the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So he's telling Paul where he's going to go, what he's going to say, and why he's going to be there. So Paul hears directly from Jesus, not an angel, but directly from the Lord himself. Here's where you're going to go, here's why you're going to go there, and here's what you're going to say. How many of you who struggle with faith, if Jesus would just appear to you at night by your bed, call you by name, and say, here's where you're going to go, here's why you're going to go there, here's what you're going to say, even you could believe it, right? right. It's, it's show, even you people that are, you know, struggle with faith, even then, if Jesus manifested himself to you physically, audibly, you go, okay, I'm in, I believe. So Paul gets this right from the, right from the Lord, right? So Paul is right now in faith. He understands where he's going and why. Time passes, and trials take place, and now he is appealed to Rome, and he is getting ready on a board, a cargo ship, and they're on this journey, and now they're in Crete, 
And Paul says, it's too late in the season. We should stay here, port here. We'll winter here. When spring comes, we'll leave again. However, there's guys who have grain on the ship, and they got product to deliver. And they get in the captain's ear, and they say, we got to keep going. You know, we, we can do it. We can make it. The captain listens to them men, those men and not Paul. And when they're out in the water, it's like trying to sail on Superior in, you know, in November. That's not a good thing to do. They set out to sail, and they encounter a harsh storm called a Northeaster. And, it's a hard, and it lasts for days. And listen to what happens in Acts chapter 27, verse 18. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they begin to throw the cargo overboard. All those prophets, you know, all that grain thrown into the sea. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Now it's going to get really hard. You're throwing the tackle and the riggings. It's getting really hard to even steer that ship. You know, they throw it all in the water. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved, except for Paul, who's much more spiritual than the rest of us. Is that in your Bibles? It wasn't in mine either. We look at verse 20, it says, We, Luke says, it's inclusive, everybody. We, including Apostle Paul, finally gave up all hope of being saved. So, remember Jesus had said to Paul, you're going to testify in Rome. Which means what? You can't die at sea. It's hard. I've often found it's hard to testify when you're dead. And so he is at sea. He can't drown because he's got, God himself has said you're going to go to Rome. But Paul, in the midst of the storm, has forgotten the promise. When you've been in a storm day after day, month after month, sometimes year after year, and the winds are relentless. And the storm rages and you're tired. And the sun's not showing up and it's dark. Have you ever been tempted to forget the promise? And go from faith to fear? I have. I've been there. It's hard. And Paul was a human being. He was an apostle, a great man. But he was a human being and he goes into fear. He forgets the promise. Looks what happens to the rest of the story. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have, I love the last little zinger Paul has to get in here. You should have listened to my advice and not sailed from Crete. We would have spared ourselves damage and loss. If you'd only listened to me, this wouldn't have happened. But now I urge you to keep up your courage. Because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. <laughs> kind of like one of those uh, medications, uh, commercials on TV that tells you all the good things it's going to do for you, then kind of says real fast all the bad things that can happen. <laughs> you could have left that out, Paul. Just tell us, you know, not one of you will be lost. You don't have to say, and the ship will be destroyed. You don't want to get on an airline. This is a captain. Uh, I got some good news. Uh, all of us are going to survive this flight, but we are going to crash. Have a nice day, and thank you for flying, you know. You don't want to hear that. Paul's telling them the truth. Everybody's going to be saved, but we're going to want to ground. And they're thinking, how does that work? How do you be on a ship in the middle of the sea in a storm, crash the ship, and everybody live? It doesn't matter how good of a swimmer you are, you're going to drown in a circumstance like that. So Paul says, here's why I believe that. Last night, an angel of the God whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. Why did he say do not be afraid to Paul? Because Paul was what? Afraid. Those are the kind of people you say do not be afraid to. You don't say that to happy people. You don't say it to sad people. You say it to fearful people. Paul had gotten into fear. He'd forgotten the promise. You must stand trial before Caesar. Remember? This is not new news to Paul. He's being reminded of what Jesus himself has already said. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Notice the past tense. God has graciously. Past tense. When God speaks it, it's as good as being done. 
When God makes a promise, it's as good as being realized. So even though they're still in the midst of the storm, the storm is still raging, in the, in the realm of faith, it's done. God has given you the lives of all who sail with you. Verse 25. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen to me just as He told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Bad news. We're going to be saved. Bad news. We're going to call crash. And ironically, the thing that they feared crashing became the very thing that saved their lives. You say, well, explain. So when the, the ship crashes and the bow of the boat gets stuck in the, the sand, it can't escape because of the pressure of the waves. And the waves keep crashing against the stern of the boat. And it's so terrifying that guys are trying to jump off. And Paul says, don't jump off. If you jump off, you're going to die. Stay with the boat. Sometimes faith defies reason, right? Sometimes faith, def- almost all the time, really. <laughs> Stay on the boat. Yeah, but the boat's going to break apart. Stay on the boat. But I can't swim. Stay on the boat. And they even cut away the, sh- the, you know, the things off the boat, the life preservers. They couldn't use them. And the boat crashes and it breaks apart. And each one of those pieces becomes a flotation device. And they paddle their way to shore. The very thing that they thought was going to destroy them was what God uses to save them. That's true, isn't it? Sometimes God can take the fragments of our life, the, thing, the broken pieces, and use that very thing to bring redemption to us. Paul remembered the promise that he had forgotten. That's the third principle. Promise and not circumstances. When we do those things, then that enables us to overcome fear. And it's not just one of those three, three principles, it's all three of those principles working together. And there's a synergistic effect that happens with that. We look at verses 12 and thir- 13. God is now speaking again, first person, to Israel. And he says, I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you fear mere mortals? Remember who you are. Human beings who are but grass. Verse 13, that you forget the Lord your maker. Remember that clip we saw? You've forgotten me. I could never forget you, Father. You've forgotten who you are and thus forgotten me, he said in that clip. And God says the same thing. You've forgotten who you are. You've forgotten the rock from which you were hewn, and thus you've forgotten your Maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid out the foundations of the earth. Who are you that you should live in constant terror every day because of the wrath of the oppressor who has been under destruction? For where is the wrath of the oppressor? Another way to put that is, who does it matter who the oppressor is if I'm on your side? Think of Romans 8, 31, when Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Or if God is for us, what does it matter who's against us? And that enables us to have faith and to move forward instead of being stagnant or move backwards. Remember the clip with Simba. And Simba is living in this wilderness and just away from his heritage and his his destiny. And his uncle Scar has run in the kingdom into the ground, and it's dark and it's ugly. And he's afraid because he knows he's no match for Scar. And so he's going to live out his days and waste, you know, he says, you are more than you've become, his dad says. He's going to waste his potential because of fear. But then he learns and he gets back, and his father reminds him in the vision of the promise. Reminds him of his purpose. And he goes from fear to faith. And when that happens, he propels him forward. Let's listen, watch the next clip of the movie. What was that? (laughs) The weather. (laughs) Very peculiar. Don't you think? Yeah. Looks like the winds are changing. Ah, change is good. Yeah, but it's not easy. I know what I have to do, but going back means I'll have to face my past. I've been running from it for so long. Ow! 
Oh, jeez, what was that for? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. <laughs> yeah, but it still hurts. Oh, yes, the past can hurt. But the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. Ah, you see? So what are you going to do? First, I'm going to take your stick. No, 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 no. Not your stick. Hey, where are you going? I'm going back. Good. Go on. Get out of here. <laughs> I've watched that four times now, and I love it every time. <laughs> Where are you going? I'm going back. I'm going to fulfill my destiny. You know, when I was a boy, and I've, I've told this story, and it's been 10 years ago. So if you've heard it before, you're an old timer. Uh, and uh, I feel like after 10 years, I can repeat an illustration. When I was in grade school, third grade to be exact, I was tormented by a boy named Noah. And Noah was a bully, and he picked on a lot of kids. And he was a big kid. He was in third grade, and he should have been in, like, high school. <laughs> and uh, but he was just, like, walk around, just really tough and big and strong, and, every, you know, give me your money, give me your money. And I'm, like, you know, giving him my money, and I just live in terror, this kid, this bully. And I would, like, find other ways to get home so I could avoid Noah and, uh, you know, having to give him my money. And one day I'm walking home, and I... I, I he catches me, and I'm in front of my buddy Billy's house, who's an old dude. He's in fifth grade, but he's my good friend, and uh, he's there outside, and he sees this transpire, and so I can't be a chicken in front of my friend Billy, but my heart is pounding. He comes up to me, and he says, give me your money. I look at my friend Billy, and Billy's like, you know, don't do it. Don't do it, and I go, No. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to give you my money. I, I was a, pretty much a wimp. Unless you said something about my mama. <laughs> then you had a fight on your hands. But other than that, I was a pretty peaceful kid. Pretty wimpy kid. Didn't want confrontation. I said, no, I, 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 I'm not going to give you my money, Noah. And Noah, it's wintertime, and he draws a line in the snow with his foot. And he goes, oh, yeah? Step across that line. And I look over at Bill, and Bill goes, go ahead, Jeff, step across the line. I'm here. This is different now. <laughs> my buddy got my back, right? And I'm looking how small I am compared to Noah, and then I start looking about how small Noah is compared to Billy, who's got my back, right? A pastor back home used to say, everybody would look at Goliath and said, oh, look how big Goliath is compared to me. And David comes on the scene and says, look how small Goliath is compared to God. And so I stepped across the line. You know what Noah did? Nobody stood up to him before. And he draw another one. He said, step across that line. Go over a bill. But go. Step across that line. How many lines are you going to draw? You know, how long is this going to go on? I look over at Bill, and Bill goes, get him. So I jump across that third line. I just start popping him. You leave me alone. You stop taking my money. You stop being around my friends. You know, I saw Ali. I knew how to do it. And he's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. He's like, he's not tough. He's a paper tiger. And I never had a problem with that kid again. Never had to run in fear from him again all the way through grade school. Listen, there is going to be times in your walk where somebody who is against you draws a line or Satan himself draws a line and says, step across that line. And we go, oh, I don't, I don't know. And we read God's word and it reminds us he's with us. We hear the Holy Spirit say, go ahead, step across the line. Don't live your life in fear. Don't cower. Don't stagnate. Step forward in faith. And maybe even says, go get them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the words of hope spoken through Isaiah to a people who was weary and downtrodden, to a people who lived in darkness, 
who took their eyes off the promise and began to focus on the criticism of the people around them. and became discouraged. And you encouraged them through the words of Isaiah. A deliverance was coming and to not give up hope. As our team comes forward to pass out the communion to us today, it reminds us of the hope we have in Jesus, who took on the bullies of sin and death, the enemy of our soul, and purchased our salvation. He did not shirk from his calling. He crossed every line that was drawn for him. Every challenge against him he defeated. And the word says, because he lives, we too will overcome. And so we come in the name of our Savior who conquered all and receive of his body and his blood today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope you've enjoyed Truth For Today, brought to you by Faith Community Church. If you would like more information about attending our church, please call us at 608-758-2850, or you can visit us on the web at www.faithcommunitychurch.net. We'll see you next week at the same time, and thanks again for watching Truth For Today.